reaction to all of the big headlines this week and the impact they're having on your money. I'm joined right now by the Bonson Group of Hightower Advisors founder, David Bonson, joining us right now. Great to see you, David. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. So what's your take on tax reform? Is this going to be gravy for this market? Do we see another big rally once this get, gets executed, or do you worry about valuations? Um, well, the answer is both. I do believe that it is not fully priced in and that to the extent they're successful at implementation, I think you have more room to go in the market, particularly in the multinational space where companies benefit most from the corporate tax changes. But do we worry about valuations as well? Yes, we do. I mean, there is a, a certain piece of the market that feels to be fully valued, and so we have to be sensitive to both realities. Yeah, I want to talk to you about how you're allocating money now. You've got one and a quarter billion dollars in assets under management. We want to know how you're, how you're choosing to, to invest. But first, let me ask you about tax reform. Do you think they'll get this done? I really do believe they will. A lot of it has to do with the fact that they've teed it up in a much smarter way than the way they went about it with Obamacare repeal. Um, I have a lot of confidence in Gary Cohn and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. I think these are very competent and qualified guys that have worked with the key stakeholders and both sides of Congress to bring it together. But fundamentally, Maria, this is not something that has the embedded conflicts and complexity that Obamacare does. Really, what no one seems to understand is what broke it up with Obamacare care is that th within the GOP there were two totally opposite sides. There's some friction within the GOP on tax reform on the margins, but fundamentally pretty much consensus uh, exists as to what they want to accomplish. Yeah, there's a lot of common ground, but the one hurdle that we keep talking about and was in the cover of the journal on Friday was the idea that most deductions are going away, right. uh, except the mortgage deduction, charitable deduction, and retirement deduction. Uh, the deduction going away includes the deduction to uh, write down state and local income taxes. Now, the high-income states like New York, New Jersey, California, they're, they're going to get a hit on this. Peter King, congressman from New York, says he's not voting yes on this plan if it includes the uh, elimination of the state and local income tax deduction. Well, so I have two quick comments. I uh, live in both California and New York, so I couldn't be in two more inefficient tax states than that, and I fully support them eliminating this deduction because I do believe it is a subsidy that low-tax states are paying for high-tax states. But the politics of it are such that even if there are people like Congressman King, who I respect a great deal, who don't like it, it is very passable politically. I don't think they're going to have the votes for that to kill it. But the, what a lot of people are not talking about is the AMT repeal, the alternative minimum tax. Fundamentally, anyone falling in AMT has already been losing that deduction for years. Yeah. So that part gets offset. You then bring in the reduced rates, flattening of it. Nobody knows enough to know yet if it really results in a net higher tax burden for anybody. Now, real quick, you think we're going to get another bracket, a, a high bracket, like a millionaire's tax, where, yeah, most people are 12, 25, 35, but the highest earners will pay what? Um, the, what I'm hearing is that they may dangle the idea of a at five million threshold, mm -hmm. a um, uh, even higher rate than what exists now. But again, the way that they teed it up. It looks to me as if President Trump is put it out there yeah. and then going to let Congress say no to it so, yeah. so he can have the best he of both He put it on Congress. Yeah. All right, real quick, how do you invest right now, David? Let's talk. I know you like emerging markets and you like the U.S. Yes, very much. And within the U.S., we really want to be selective. It isn't that we're anti-stocks. It's just that for a person who wants to go buy and hold the S&P, they have to understand they're buying at an 18 or 19 multiple market. It's It's expensive. But I think that we want to be more selective, and we are dividend growth investors. We think that when you look at these companies growing their dividends, McDonald's had a big rally up this week, and it made me think about We've been investors in McDonald's for 10 years. We bought it. You've done well. Uh, we, well, it, our, our uh, stock price has tripled, yeah. but the dividend has tripled. Mm. And we would argue that the stock price has moved up in concert be, with the dividend growth. We want that cash flow because inflation's been so low. If inflation starts to trek a little higher, interest rates start to trek a little higher, everyone's worried about that. Dividend growth insulates you from that. These companies have pricing power. They can pass that effect on to their customers. And as shareholders, we think it insulates us and gives us that return. But also, they're just more defensive companies overall, strong free cash flow. So in the U.S., we really like those strong dividend names. McDonald's is one I'm using as an example. A lot in the energy sector are doing the same thing. Really great insights, David. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. David Bonson there. Don't go anywhere.